I wish Horatius would stop letting barbarians in here. What do you want? I'm Sentia, eldest daughter of the Magistrate. But you'd know that if you'd been invited in here and introduced properly. What are you doing in here? And why are you dressed like that? Really? I'd never have noticed what with your flawless accent, appropriate attire, and impressive mastery of our customs. Now, remind me, why are we having this conversation? Ugh, what is it with you people? You heard the rumor that my little sister escaped and figure I must know a way out too. Is that it? Well, that's just a stupid rumor. We have no idea what happened to Centilla. I wish you mouth breathers would just leave me alone. I don't know. Can you? Can you tell me how a person could have disappeared from a city with no exits and no crime? Was she snatched away by the harpies? <sighs> it was three weeks ago. We ate our evening meal together, and I remember she seemed happy. In love. We went into our rooms, I went to sleep, and when I woke up, she was gone. That's it. I think so, yes. But she was very careful about keeping his identity a secret, even from me. Because our father had plans to marry her off, eventually, and even a rumour about her attachment to some mystery man might have ruined those plans. That doesn't surprise me. To him, it was like a prized cow wandering off from its paddock. He's upset, of course, but he says he's too busy with the election to help look for her. So he's letting Horatius do the heavy lifting. Some good that's done. I don't know. But it's been three weeks since she disappeared, and he hasn't come forward. That might speak to a guilty conscience. All I know is, whoever he is, he's still here in the city. You really aren't from here, are you? All Roman women are named after their fathers. I think it's their way of branding us. Like cattle to be sold at market. His family name is Sentius. So I'm Sentia because I'm the eldest, and my little sister is formerly Sentia Minor, but she is affectionately known as Sentilla. I hope you're not insinuating I'm somehow pleased with her disappearance. Ugh, you're awful! Get out of my villa and never speak to me again! Ask Horatius to escort you out of here. Get out, you horrid barbarian!
On your best behaviour, I trust. What now? All right. Keep an eye out for Centilla, would you? You've returned. Do you have any news about your investigation? Ask them. Good. Now, was there something else you wanted to discuss? Sextus Sentius Imperiosus is my name, though Magistrate is the proper way to address me. Before I wound up here, I was a Decurian in the Cavalry of Imperial Rome, helping protect civilization from the Barbarians. It's a Cavalry Officer. I had 30 men under my command. This was my uniform. As Magistrate, I usually wear a toga, but today, I may need to survive long enough to create the portal for you, so it seemed prudent. My men and I were at the Emporium in Rome as honor guard for a visiting dignitary arriving upriver by barge. Now the port is usually bustling, but just as our guests arrived, waves of people began running toward the river from streets and alleyways in every direction. They were trying to escape a terrible fire, Unfortunately, the crowd sent my horse into a panic, and, I remember it, losing its footing by the water's edge. The next thing I knew, I was waking up on a riverbank not far from here, in the company of some stranger. I went looking for my horse, and discovered that lonely temple. You can probably figure out the rest. I was elected seven months ago uncontested because of my command experience. Since then, there's been growing agitation for another election. They're supposed to be annual, but I agreed to hold it sooner, hoping it would placate my constituents. Unfortunately, it just seems to have emboldened certain elements instead. Very well. 
If I did, I'd have led these people out of here already. I've had plenty of time to think about it. Let me see if I can sum up my thoughts. I've always considered my guiding star to be the well-being of the Roman people. Our survival and prosperity have always hinged upon honoring the peace of the gods, the sacred accord between the gods and the people of Rome. Give the gods what they want and we all prosper. Dishonor them and we all die. It's as simple as that. The real enemy in this place is not the golden rule, but human failings. The temptation to slide into degeneracy, greed, and hubris. I trust that answers your question. Thank you. I'll be waiting here for news. two talking about? Don't play dumb. I saw you. Having a shady little chat with old man Sentius up on his balcony. If he's making a last ditch effort to pick up votes by talking to a woman, he's even more senile than I thought. Everyone knows women can't vote. What else would you be murmuring about on election day? Mark my words, Maliolus is going to be magistrate by the end of the day. And if I tell him you've sided with that feeble old has-been, that you've been trying to undermine his hard-won victory, you'll have picked the wrong patron. Got it? Good, then stay out of it. Nobody likes Caput Murde foreigners interfering in an election. Ah, uh, can't hurt. The name's Domitius. You want to get to Maliolus, you go through me. Too bad. He's busy. Unless... No. You don't look like you could afford it. I'm glad you asked. See, he's a busy man, and this is an important day. He'll be inside, practicing his victory speech for tonight. Left me strict instructions he doesn't want to be disturbed. So if you want to see him, I'll need something valuable in return. Bribe? That's such an ugly word. What I'm looking for is more of a... a tribute to me, your soon-to-be patron. Dunno. Something good. Just make it good. When Maliolus wins the election, yeah? This place will change. You won't even want to leave. You'll see. I think it's gone on long enough, and Maliolus is going to put an end to it once he's elected. He's going to announce it in his victory speech. Just you wait and see. Because if I tell you, and it gets out, it'll give old man Sentius a chance to interfere in our plans. And we can't have that. We've already lined up the votes he needs to win. Just stay out of our way, and we won't have a problem. Maliolus, of course. If old man Sentius can't even protect his own daughter, how can we trust him to protect us? Whatever. Just remember, I'll be watching.
You're not thinking about going into the cistern, are you? Nobody's told you about Hannibal. Ugh. Why do I have to do everything round here? So, there was this guy called Hannibal, right? Funny accent. You should go down into the cisterns looking for junk he could clean up and sell. One day, a few weeks back, he comes out and tells me the cisterns are haunted. Said he could hear spirits wailing. Of course, nobody believed him, because who trusts a Carthaginian, right? Anyway, a few days later, he goes back in. And hours go by, and he hasn't come back out, yeah? So I go down after him, and it's dark. But in the distance, I can just make out his body sprawled out on the ground, and hunched over him was something that made my blood run cold. No word of a lie. I saw a creature. Like the corpse of a man who'd been flayed, and it was eating Hannibal. If it was a man, maybe. But I swear on my life this was no man. More like a Strix, or some Versipellus that feeds on human flesh. I didn't stick around to see which. What any sane person would have done. I legged it out of there, and put a sign at the door to warn the others. Without a weapon? Well, it's your funeral.
Vesta watch over you. I am Equitia. To what do I owe the pleasure of this visit? Oh my. I take it people are quite direct where you're from. I suppose it's quite charming in its own way. Usually, however, you wouldn't simply march up to a Vestal priestess and without due formality or courtesy ask, what is your story? The proper approach would be to arrange an introduction through a mutual acquaintance in high office, by which time you would already know how to address me. And then you would find a way to satisfy your curiosity rather more indirectly. But to be honest, I've often thought what an unnecessarily formal way to communicate that is. So, let's do it your way. You just keep being yourself and ask whatever you like. It'll be a refreshing change. No, I'm not entirely sure. But what about you? How did you end up here? Karen, you say? And nothing about that name seemed... odd to you. Older. I see. Hmm. I wonder if... No. I apologize. I don't mean to be cryptic. It's just that you've got me thinking. Have you spoken with any of the others about how they arrived here too? I really think you should. Go around and ask them what they remember and see if you notice any patterns. Good. Thank you. But please be careful. I just don't want to see what happened to Livia happen to you, too. Up until a few weeks ago, she was a perfectly productive member of our little community, darning clothes and cutting hair. She was always so chatty, always seeking out newcomers and asking them where they were from and how they wound up here. And then, about a month ago, she suddenly changed. She withdrew, stopped working and became despondent, started muttering to herself. Galerius and I visited her to see how we could help, but she just looked at us with this haunted stare, called us bloodless shadows, and told us we were ignorant of some pattern. Look, it could be unrelated. Perhaps she simply fell ill, or, as Galerius suggested, the weight of the golden rule was too much for her. But there is a small chance that she learned something, saw a pattern nobody else saw, and that it broke her. I just don't want to see that happen to you. So be careful, will you? Thank you. Now, go and follow the thread of truth through this labyrinth, and come back to me if you discover any patterns. I don't, I'm afraid. It seems to me we're exiled here until the gods judge us, one way or another. I'm quite sure it's the work of the gods, which is strange because they've never been particularly concerned with our misdeeds, as long as we've kept the peace of the gods. We ask for blessings, for good health, bountiful harvest, military victory, and in return, we offer praise, wine, incense, or animals. But here, it seems they require much more of us. 
I find myself reminded of an especially pertinent tale from our great poet Ovid in his epic Metamorphoses. Would you like to hear it? It is rather long. Wonderful. It goes like this. Baucis and Philemon were an old married couple living a humble life in a small town. One night, the town gets a visit from a couple of vagrants. They go from door to door, asking for a place to stay the night. Of course, being vagrants, they're turned away sharply from house after house, a thousand in all. Until finally they come to the little cottage where Baucis and Philemon lived. Now the kind old couple had very little to offer, but nevertheless, they invite these strangers into their house and offer them food, wine and a place to stay. In they begin gulping down the old couple's wine, so much so that Baucis, the old lady, begins to worry they're going to run out. And then she notices something strange. Her wine pitcher keeps refilling itself, as if by magic, realizing only a select few possess such powers. Says to her husband, Philemon, I think these men are gods in disguise. Immediately the couple begins apologizing for offering such coarse wine and the vagrants metamorphosize and reveal themselves to be Jupiter, the king of the gods, and Mercury, the trickster god. They confide they didn't mind the meager offerings. They were just pleased that someone in the town offered them hospitality. Then Jupiter says to them, You have passed our test, but everyone else in this city failed, so we are going to destroy this place and everyone in it, except you, who we will grant a wish. So old Baucis and Philemon escape up into the mountains safely, and they receive their wish, which is for eternity together. Meanwhile, Jupiter carries through with his threat and wipes that city off the map. Some say the moral of that story is that we must all honor the sacred rituals of guest friendship, the reciprocal obligations owed between hosts and guests. But I like to think it's that we should always show compassion for those less fortunate than ourselves. A cynic philosopher might take that view, but it's not entirely invalid, I suppose. It must be completed by dusk, just the same as any other official business. It'll be between Sentius, the incumbent, and Maliolus, the challenger. Why do you ask? All of the male citizens who are willing and able to attend, unless they're running, of course. Hmm, that's just the way it's always been, I'm afraid. It never sat right with me, either. There are some women who can vote, vestal priestesses like myself, but in this case, given my role overseeing the election, I've decided to abstain. I can't allow the perception that I'm being anything but fair and independent, but if it's any consolation, there are other ways to influence the outcome of an election. By using whatever gifts the gods gave you. Nothing untoward, of course. I'm responsible for announcing it and making sure the procedures are followed. You can, assuming they're eligible and willing to accept the nomination. As I said, I'm planning to hold it before dusk, but I suppose I could hold it sooner, if there's a good reason. As you wish. Certainly. And did you notice anything? A pattern? Oh, well then. Keep asking people how they wound up here. I don't want us to rush to any conclusions yet. Livia's fate weighs heavily on my mind and dictates we should be sure. Yes, you should ask the others first. Come back to me once you've acquainted yourself with the rest of our neighbors.
Sometimes I stare at the great temple on the bluff, and I think, whatever is in there, it has to be important. face. Salve, and welcome to a little community. My name's impossible to pronounce for most people, so you can just call me Virgil. You arrived on a sad day, friend. What with Julia's death? I wish we could have met under better circumstances. Well, I'm an architect. Or at least I was back in Rome. That's probably too grandiose a term to describe what I do here. Help out with repairs and try to stop old buildings from collapsing on people, that kind of thing. But you probably don't want to hear about the ingenious architecture or mysterious history of this place. Oh, I'm glad you asked. Some of these shrines were constructed hundreds of years ago, which means Romans have been arriving here for at least that long. But there's one thing that puzzles me. The oldest shrine in this avenue isn't Roman at all. It's Greek. Well, yes, that could be the reason. Or it could mean that there were Greeks living and worshipping here before the Romans arrived. Which begs the interesting question, who really built this place? And could it be far older than any of us imagine? If only there was a way we could talk to the people who came here before us. The stories they could tell. Gladly. Personally, my favorite thing about this place is the aqueducts. Those series of adjoining arches. They're an ingenious feat of Roman engineering with a very practical purpose. They take fresh water coming from outside the city and distribute it all across the chasm. It's funneled below the palace and into a cistern beneath the great temple. Some of it flows down into another cistern beneath the villas. And the rest is funneled to the shrine of Proserpina, where it fills the lake and allows us to fish and farm. Hey, not so loud. Just talking about that could anger the gods for all we know. I'm not saying it's impossible, but you'd have to find a way inside somehow. Just, please, try to be a bit more discreet about it. You mean the Great Temple? This one's a bit of a mystery. Given the way it's positioned so prominently, looking down on us, it's clear that whoever built it felt it was the most important temple in the city. Unfortunately, someone else went out of their way to keep its purpose a mystery. You see, usually a temple is dedicated to a particular god, like Proserpina or Diana or Apollo. Usually, that god is obvious. But in this case, it's unknown. There's an obelisk out the front, which probably used to bear the name of this unknown god. But it appears some barbarian defaced it. And of course we can't get inside because it's locked up tighter than the temple of Saturn in Rome. And that contains the treasury. So we're all left wondering, which god is that temple dedicated to? And could it be the one responsible for the golden rule? Unless somebody figures out a way inside, I suppose we'll never know. Of course. You wouldn't believe how often the new ones ask that question. But I tell you the same thing I tell everyone else. There are much worse places to live out your days. 
You might have a few sleepless nights thinking about the golden rule, but once you get used to the fear, knowing that a single slip-up could cost you everything, it's not too bad. Nothing new to me, anyway. Oh, I just mean I grew up in the Batavi tribe, far to the north in Novio Magus, and learned to expect a bit of hostility. They weren't nearly as tolerant as the Romans. Some people say it's divine, the work of a god, but I'm not so sure. It just seems so flawed to me. Like it's distinctly human. I mean, once you've been here long enough, you'll notice people doing things that just seem so wrong to you. But this so-called god doesn't seem to care, which means one of two things. Either you don't know the difference between right and wrong, or this unknown god doesn't. And I'm pretty sure I know the difference. Do you? Good. Then I'll hope you'll agree that there are only two ways of dealing with unfair rulers. The first is to leave. The second is to remove the ruler from power. And it seems leaving may not be an option. Good question. It's best if I say no more, but I hope you give it some thought. Look, I haven't done anything wrong, if that's what you're thinking. Somebody just has a problem with my preference for male company. Hey, nothing gets by you, huh? Sorry, that was mean. Yes, I like men. And when you grow up in the north as I did, in the city of Novio Magus, you expect a bit of hostility. The Batavi are not known for their tolerance. I saw enough friends killed or driven away to know the cost of not keeping your personal affairs to yourself. So I hid who I was for... what was it? Nearly ten years? Watching what I said and where I looked. But that kind of fear eats away at you slowly, until living isn't any better than the thing you were afraid of. Needless to say, since I'm now living underground, halfway across the known world with an assumed name, my openness didn't go down well among the enlightened folk of the Batavi. Nice of you to say, but not necessary. In any case, the Romans are far more accepting, and among them, I get to be who I am. Or at least, I thought that was the case. It seems I was wrong. Ah, uh, it's not just graffiti. I have quite a collection of handwritten notes too. The strange thing is, I keep my personal affairs to myself. I've never really been interested in any of the men here. Not my type. So I'm not sure what I could have done to upset this person. If I had to guess, I'd say it's probably one of those cultists. Strange bunch. They insist there's only one God, and that he considers my nature a sin. Can you believe that? If there are any of them here, they won't admit it. Not since they supposedly burned down half of Rome last year and went into hiding. All I know is, if these threats keep escalating, eventually my secret admirer is going to cross a line and break the golden rule. What? Really? I... I didn't expect that. But thanks. It's always a pleasure to meet someone so selfless. I'm glad you arrived when you did. I'd start by figuring out who the cultists are. Or maybe ask around among the merchants here. Someone who lives or works in the forum must have seen something. But if you find them... Please don't hurt or humiliate them. I suspect they're just confused. Well, Maliolis is talking about loosening some of the restrictions in this place. And while it's all a bit vague, at least he has a vision. My vote isn't for sale, if that's what you're asking. Nice to talk to you.
fellow traveler from a faraway land. Greetings, I'm Georgius. It gladdens me to see another foreigner in our midst. We must stick together, you and I. And I must say, my sartorial friend, your clothing is most extraordinary. Leather boots in place of sandals, trousers with precise stitching, and such a curious design. I have traveled distant trade routes from the markets of Damascus to the farms of India, and never have I seen anyone dressed quite like you. Tell me, I must know, from which exotic part of the world do you hail? And now you have me more intrigued than before. But since it appears you do not wish to share, I will wait until we are better friends. We will have much time here to get to know one another. But for now, do you require assistance? I know you do not require clothing, so information perhaps? My story? How kind of you to ask. I am a tailor and I run the humble shop in the fall. You mean to say, with all the turmoil and terror of the Golden Rule, and so few customers, why bother setting shop at all? I'll tell you, it is precisely because of the Golden Rule that I wish to remind my friends of the importance of looking one's best. I say, the more of our customs we preserve down here, the more we can preserve a semblance of normality, the better our chances of keeping our heads. Don't you agree? A good question, a very good question indeed, and I would be happy to tell you if only I could remember it clearly myself. Hmm, I remember I had just been to Rome to sell an extraordinary selection of wares, and drowning in coin, I decided to celebrate my success. I rented a prestigious villa by the Tiber, invited over a few select friends, and we began making our way through some of the most exquisite wine money could buy. Quite a lot of it, in fact. Now, I have had visions and awoken in strange places before. I have even found myself naked in the desert sands more than once, but none of that compares to this. This time, I remember people screaming, then falling into a void as empty as time before creation, gasping for air, and then nothing. When I regained my faculties, I was lying naked by the banks of the Tiber, gods know how many miles from my villa. Indeed, I'm lucky I was carrying a little extra weight. <laughs> I believe it kept me afloat. In any case, it seems I'd been rescued and resuscitated by a benevolent stranger. I went to find firewood for his campfire, stumbled across a cave and discovered that trapdoor temple. And here I am. Anything you like. Shh! Not so loud! What are you playing at? I must ask you to stop that at once! Have you not been told about the last attempt? Oh, then I suppose this duty falls to me. Ah, it is a long story. Of course, the first question any of us asks when we first arrive is, how do I escape? It is only natural after all. And scaling the chasm wall is out of the question, for it is simply too steep and too far. But as they say, if the wind fails, use the oars. And here the second option is to leave the way we came in, through the shaft above the bathhouse. See, the shaft is quite high, but if one gathered up enough wood, one could make a series of ladders and climb one's way out. They have! I am getting to that! There was an attempt made by resourceful fellows who lived here some years ago. They even decided to keep records of their escape attempt for posterity. Unfortunately, as soon as they began to carry the first ladder down the hallway, they heard a godlike voice sink the entire city. And that, tragically, is where their tale ends. So it seems that to merely attempt escape is to invite the wrath of whichever god oversees this place. And so I say, it is best to not even discuss it aloud. Ah, yes. 
the many shall suffer for the sins of the one. As a Greek, this is nothing new to me. It is how our gods operate. Have you not heard the tale of the god Hades? He was the first to learn this dreadful lesson when he abducted Persephone and imprisoned her in the underworld. When Demeter, the mother of Persephone, learned of this, she did not punish Hades, the guilty one. Instead, she changed the climate of Earth so that it became hot and dry. Nothing grew. The grain turned to empty husks and the rivers dried up. Innocent people died by the tens of thousands until at last the other gods were forced to act lest they have no worshippers left. So yes, we know this rule. This has always been the case. The golden rule has merely brought it into focus. If we are to survive, I say we must each keep the simple wisdom of Thales of Miletus, first of the seven sages of Greece, who said, Avoid doing what you would blame others for doing. Regrettably, I think you are correct, my friend. For even if 99% of us adopt this principle, that will never be enough. Sadly, no matter how well we protect ourselves, the life's work of many good people can be undone in the blink of an eye by a single selfish act. It is not all bad, my friend, because it is this fragility which makes life so precious. But on a lighter note, I will say one thing for the golden rule. For all their grim and haunting poses, these golden statues do make magnificent models for my clothing, do they not? <laughs> that, my friend, is quite the dilemma. But after some reflection, I'm leaning toward voting for Maleolus. I do not enjoy the thought of another visit from Domitius if I voted the wrong way. Nothing comes to my mind, my friend. This is troubling, is it not? I am afraid I have no idea. It is ridiculous though, Virgil is a fine man. But my young friend Fabia confided in me that she saw someone leaving graffiti on his shop front last night. Perhaps you should ask her about it. I hope that our paths cross again soon, my friend. You look well, my sartorial friend. Huh? Help! You have to do something! A man arrived in the baths. Real nasty sort, with his face all covered up. And he's got a weapon. 
You have to do something, or he's gonna break the golden rule. None of us do. The Magistrate made us throw them all into the chasm. So now this man's bow is the only one in the city. You'll just have to improvise. Thank you. He's still in there, somewhere. I have to hide. Find me in this empty shrine when it's over. Hear what? What? We don't have time for this. I have to go. Ugh. The shrine is collapsing! You have to do something. You have to do something, or he's gonna break. Are you serious? This is an emergency. Are you going to help or not? None of us do. The magistrate, you'll just have to improvise. Thank you. He's still in there, somewhere. I have to hide. Find me in this empty shrine when it's over. What? We don't have time for this. I have to go. The shrine is collapsing. Stop right there. I am looking for Tiberius Quinctius Crispus, otherwise known as Quinctius. Do you know where he is? I'm not sure I believe that, so allow me to explain something to you. I am here with orders from Emperor Nero himself to find and execute the cultist Quinctius for terrible crimes against the Empire. So, if you tell me the truth, I will allow you to live. But if you lie to me, or otherwise obstruct the Emperor's business in any way, I will put this arrow through your chest. Is that understood? 
You are not off to a good start. When I ask you a question, I expect an answer. Is that understood? Thank you. Now tell me, who are you people? And what is this place? A small community. <laughs> I was told Quintius was a cultist, but I never thought he'd be foolish enough to lead me right to the heart of his mystery cult. You say that, but if you're not a cult, then why go to such great lengths to keep this place a secret? So you admit you're not allowed to leave. Threatening me is not going to help you, but in any case, that sounds an awful lot like a cult to me. And I saw the inscription saying, the many shall suffer for the sins of the one. I take it this is some kind of mantra you all believe? Ugh, a distinction without a difference. You've clearly been indoctrinated into this nonsense. Now tell me, where did you lot get enough gold to make all these statues? You lot are practicing human sacrifice too. You people disgust me. Of course you'd say that, but that's what your kind do, isn't it? Our God told us to do it. It's all clear to me now. The secret sanctuary, the indoctrination, the mantra, the human sacrifice. You're cultists, there's no doubt in my mind. What baffles me is how a person can believe in something with such zeal. They just can't see what they've become. However, you still have a chance to redeem yourself by telling me where Quintius is. Do not waste it. Very well, here's what I know. He's a 40 to 50 year old man with distinctive eyes, one green and one blue. He's also known to have delusions of grandeur. The Emperor says he and his cult, your cult, are responsible for starting the fire which burnt half of Rome to the ground and killed thousands in the process. All I know, all I care about, is that the Emperor believes he is guilty and wants him dead. The details are not my concern. This is your last chance. Are you going to tell me where he is or not? <sighs> then you're of no use to me. Do you have any last words? Well, I'd say that's rather convenient, since I was planning to kill you all anyway. The many shall suffer for the sins of the one. friend. I'm Galerius. Uh, I don't think so. I've 
never seen you before in my life. Oh, Bacchus, how much did I drink last night? Uh, sorry to have bothered you. Oh, and since you seem to be in a hurry, you should try out this device I made. Worked real hard on it. Just attach the pulley to the rope over the lake and hang onto the handles. If it works, it'll be faster than walking. And if it doesn't work, worst thing that can happen is you'll take a swim in the lake. I haven't quite summoned the courage to test it myself. But don't worry, it's completely safe. Probably. All right, see you around. <laughs>